I'm John Bowden. We're up to our entire interview with super producer Terry Brown, who in the early days worked with Barbra Streisand at Olympic Studios, The Trogs, The Who. In the early days, Jimi Hendrix. Briefly, there were a lot of people he worked with, most notably, of course, Rush. He did all their albums for their heyday, 2112, before that Fly By Night, Hemispheres, Moving Pictures. But of course, in this one, we're going to talk a lot about Rush and a little bit about a Klaatu, The Who, and how he got to where he got. The rules that he used to sort of become successful, and a lot more. Our entire interview with the great Terry Brown. Through my YouTube channel, sometimes I talk to like producers and they're always going, and here I am, <laughs> Bill Simsek from the Eagles, you know, I was, yeah. I was talking to him and he's, he says, he says, I don't know why the new technology is because his son helps him. Who's a producer as well. And he says, for whatever reason, I can't, I can't get into this. I'm an old school guy. You know, I got studers in my basement, you know, that's. <laughs> oh, by the way, yeah. Bill Simzik said he, you know, I said, is there anybody else you you missed out on record uh, producing? He says I want to wanted to produce Rush. Is that right? I love it. <laughs> you know, I I and I said, okay, well, why? I'm just kind of curious because I know where you've come from. I knew his discography, and he says because I wanted to work with the best musicians in the world. Yeah, they were they were great. They still are two of them. Unfortunately, yeah. we like. Lost Neil, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, yeah, I still have a studer. I think it's an A eight. Oh, you have a studer. I thought I, you meant. I no, thought I do. Speaking in Bill Simzik's voice. No, no. Uh, I still have one in my basement, and those things now sell for ten thousand dollars on eBay. I'll never sell it, but it's insane. Really? What, like a two track or? It's just a two track. It was used at the uh, ninety six K Light in Edmonton when I where I started. And my boss, Len Tucson, one day told me, he says, do you want to buy it? And I looked it up and I said, Len, I can't afford this. It's like 10 grand on eBay. And he says, no, I'll give it to you for a thousand bucks. I fired you. I fired you in 84. Wow. There you go. That's anyway. great. That's great. Do you kill, do, have you kept any of that? That, that you, you don't keep that stuff. It's heavy. No, and old. I, I bought a lot of it when I was younger. Um, I bought an AA, AA, A80 24 track and ended up selling it. And I have a I have a Revox now, <laughs> which doesn't I never use. I mean, I moved into the digital era back in eighty what eighty two when we did Moving Pictures. That was one of the first digitally mixed albums, and uh, I never looked back. I've I stayed digital. I've done one analog mix since then, and that's like what forty years ago. I remember we used to record my show, Cross Canada Report. We were syndicated across the country. And I went to Damon Studios in Edmonton, and, and they had a Neve board. And I remember thinking that was, I was like, ooh, what's going on here? Like, just thinking, I don't know, this is. I, I do have a Neve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a Neve 8816, which is like a, a rack-mounted 16-input uh, um, mixing bus. Mm -hmm. It sounds fantastic. Before we get to the meaty stuff, uh, have you? I, I saw that video online where they're going upstairs and there's all those beautiful gold albums. I take it that's your house or one of your houses, all all your gold and platinum albums. Yeah, uh, where did you see that? There was a video where someone talks to you about I forget what album. I've seen so many videos of yours in the last few days. Like it's I'm gone wonky. Uh, that's why I'm going to be like horseshit all over the road with this because I've got bits and pieces on my note notes here but anyway was that not your house uh going upstairs and as you go upstairs yeah 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 is that yeah. this house no no this is um my my spouse my partner <clears throat> we we live down in the uh west end of toronto right near the lake my place is up north at, in port carling in um in muskoka and i have uh my studio there okay a okay. mixing studio which is uh, at the bottom of those stairs. Is I can't that right? remember who that was because I don't remember anybody coming and doing an interview with me. I'll send it to you. Yeah, would you? I'll send it to you, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd I'll be find fascinated. It. Before we get to the meaty stuff, uh, have you? I, I saw that video online where they're going upstairs and there's all those beautiful gold albums. I take it that's your house or one of your houses, all, all your gold and platinum albums. Yeah, uh, where did you see that? 
There was a video where someone talks to you about, I forget what album. I've seen so many videos of yours in the last few days. Like it's, I'm gone wonky. Uh, that's why I'm going to be like horse shit all over the road with this because I've got bits and pieces on my note notes here but anyway was that not your house uh going upstairs and as you go upstairs, yeah 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 is that yeah. this house no no this is um my my spouse my partner <clears throat> we we live down in the uh, west end of toronto right near the lake my place is up north at, in port carling in um in muskoka and i have uh my studio there okay a okay. mixing studio which is uh, at the bottom of those stairs. Is I can't that right? remember who that was because I don't remember anybody coming and doing an interview with me. I'll send it to you. Yeah, would you? I'll send it to you, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd I'll be find fascinated. It. You had a job at an advertising agency and you, you didn't like it very much. And so where did that lead to? The studio. Yeah, it, it was, um, we used to, I was working in the mail room um, in order to get, higher up the ladder, you really need to have a public school education in England, which I didn't have. Uh, but my father was in advertising and quite successful. So um, I thought, well, you know what, I'll do this because I wanted I left school, so I had to do something. So I ended up in the mail department. And we used to pick up the mail for Peter Aldersley, who was um, running this radio show um, Radio Luxembourg, and I believe it was it was run well. It was it was run out of London, and and but it was called Radio Luxembourg. And the young fellow who used to come and pick up the mail for him, his assistant, had an opportunity to get into a studio. And I was saying, wow, you know that sounds really fantastic. I I wish you the best of luck. And if you don't get it, give me a shout. Anyway, he didn't get it because the pay was like like 10 bucks a, a week. It was ridiculous. And uh, he was married with a child on the way. So he came back the following day and he said, I didn't, I, I couldn't take that job. He said, but Keith would love to see you. This Keith Grant, who's one of the top engineers in London. And I said, Oh, great. Okay. I'll pop over and see him. Still didn't really register. I went over and saw him. We hit it off. I started the following Monday. It was amazing. And Did, I never looked back. I'm curious about your parents. Does it make sense you got to where you got in your career based on where your parents are? And half the people I talk to, they go, oh, God, my parents weren't musical at all. What were your parents like? Uh, my mother was, um, she encouraged me to play piano. So I, I was playing classical piano and reading music at that time. Um, which I completely dropped and forgot once I got in the studio working with professional musicians. I was like, oh, my God, I, I, don't, I don't play piano. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, she was very influential in that. And my father being in advertising got me into that advertising gig, which got me the job in the studio. I mean, life is like that. I'm a firm believer in destiny. Was it Olympic Studios? Because you were there. Yeah, in yeah, it was the original Olympic. On yeah. uh, Carlton Muse, it, just off Baker Street. It, insane, considering in, in 64, I mean, that's when we, I mean, I was four. Uh, that's when we started hearing all the, you know, the British invasion, everything. Oh, went. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I was involved in a lot of that. I mean, I, I got to record um, Substitute with The Who, and I was on sessions with Donovan and uh, Marianne Faithful. God, PJ Proby, you name it. Barbara oh. Streisand. I mean, the list is huge. Yeah, I I read that the, the Streisand thing. Uh, uh, I I can't help but stop there. What? How did that? How did the Streisand thing happen? Well, she wanted to record in London. She bought over an American arranger, and I was very young at the time, and it's a long time ago, so I don't remember all the details. But she bought <clears throat> she bought them over. They hired the, the uh, London Symphony and um or members of thereof and uh, we recorded the uh uh the album in a few days yeah but right straight off the floor she sang live four track do you, <laughs> do you remember the album i i did and as soon as i mentioned it i forgot it i'll look it uh, up it's um oh geez no i 
the waste yeah. time. I'll, if yeah. I think of it in a minute, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, what about the who? What, Lord's what? Prayer. I think it was called the Lord's Prayer. The who? Now, Substitute. That's a yeah. classic song. Uh, um, what were they like? The, the Trogs. Wild thing. Keith was engineering that, but um, I, I was tape hopping. But the, the who I engineered, yeah. They were great to work with. It was a lot of fun. I mean, it was so early in the day. I didn't even know who they were at the time. Yeah, you had said before there was kind of an unassuming, not non-rock star part oh, of the industry. Totally, totally. Yeah, it was nothing like it is today. You know, he were like, you know, like, Ooh. it wasn't like that then. It was just, hey, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm Pete Townsend. Hey, Pete, you know, <laughs> set up the drums. And, you know, I mean, I can remember setting up the drums for, um, oh, Cream's drummer. What's his name? Uh, Ginger Baker. Ginger Baker. And he scared the crap out of me. He scares the crap down, out of everybody. <laughs> I'd go down and we'd have to adjust this, you know, floor tom mic. And, and he'd be like, what are you doing? He was like, I'm just adjusting a mic. That was funny. I I just interviewed Stuart Copeland and he talked about, he said, you know, that kit back there. And I said, yeah. He says, Ginger Baker played on it. I said, did he go like this? He says, no, everyone knows those stories. And I just talked to Malcolm, who's Jack Bruce's son. And for a long time, it was, I won't keep you that long, but he and I just got along like a house on fire. And he basically said, he says, well, no, no, the Ginger was, that, that was Ginger. But then oh, yeah. you, you had to go through so many layers to get to know the real guy, you know? Yeah. Talented guy. Wow. Really? Unbelievable. Jimi Hendrix. You know what Mark Farner of Grand Funk told me? He says, you know, I got to know him a little bit. And everyone, Caleb Quay of Elton John's band said the same thing. He says, you know what? He's he's kind of shy. Oh, yeah. What did he you think? He, he was great. I, I used to sort of just sit on the stairs and drink coffee with him and chat with him. It was like, oh, yeah. Didn't he? I didn't really know who he was at the time. And then... About a month or two later, I got to to work on one of his albums um, because Eddie Kramer was busy that night and couldn't do it. So I got I lucked into that. But he was lovely to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you find <laughs> back then, do you find back then that unassuming, not knowing who they are, enabled you to sort of just be cool with these guys? You kind of knew that, that, whatever, they're just another guy. Yeah, of course. I mean, I've always been a bit like that. I'm, I, no matter who I've worked with, it's like we're here to work together. We're all, you know, part of the same team. So I've, I've never, never really aspired to that, um, you know, rock star syndrome. I mean, there's been a couple of occasions where I've met people and I'm like, wow. Like who? But, uh, like who? I'm curious. I, I, I can't remember off the bat, but I, I, I can remember vaguely. You know, there's been a couple of occasions, but generally speaking, it's like, you know what? We're all in this together. <laughs> One more thing about the Trog's Wild thing. I always looked at that song, dun, dun, t -t 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 -t, you know, of, of that that influenced. I mean, that was influenced by other things, but it also influenced so many riffs for so many other people. That song, it, no one does not know that song. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's a great tune. I love uh, it. It's so much fun to do, too. You worked with uh, uh, Mother Lode, When I Die. If, mm. if there's, I, I've got no wow. one talking about them, and I want to include them. Uh, Smitty, uh, you know, what a, that guy, I didn't realize, had done so many sessions. But tell me, do you remember anything about, about that song? Uh, the, the song particularly, no. Um, or the recording. Oh, the recording was was a dream. It really was. It was one of those tunes that when you were recording it, you – you know it's going to be a hit. It was it was a real thrill. Lovely guys too. That Great has band. a real nice hippie sort of early seventies sort of oh, hippie does feel it ever. To it. Yeah. yeah, it sure does. Oh, the Stampeders. I I just talked to two of the three. Uh, okay. Again, the Canadian thing, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So you worked on that against the Grain album in seventy one. Uh, what was it by chance? Anything to do with Sweet City Woman? That that song. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I worked on what? Uh, uh, against the Grain Stampeders. It's on your discography. Do you remember that? It is? Yeah. No. No. They Well, they screwed up. I did um, Sweet City Woman. Okay. That well, that's it. on that album. 
Okay. Oh, well, that's why then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I engineered it. And um, yeah, that was, that was a fun session. I remember that quite distinctly. With Mel Shaw, right? With Mel Shaw. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, do, what, what do you remember about Mel? I know we lost him a little while ago. I talked to. Yeah. The... Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I didn't spend a lot of time with him, but he was always a real gentleman. And um, we, we always enjoyed each other's company when we got together, but it was like this business, it's, you know, you see people once every five years or something. It's like, hey, Mel, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah he, and his wife was lovely too. I don't, I, I assume she survived. Yeah, because I didn't know you were there when John Rutsey was still there. I mean. Oh, I... yeah, yeah. We, um, the, the, the band came in. The idea was I was going to mix an album. It was on eight track. They recorded it on the graveyard shift at Easton, as I remember. And uh, they didn't know what to do with it. It was like, and and Vic Wilson from from uh, management, SRO management, said, I know this tea bag over at Toronto Sound. He'll help us out. So he brought them over, and we had a blast. We really did. We recorded two tunes from scratch, Finding My Way, and forget the other one. And, um, yeah, it was, it was just a thrill. I remember the time going... Holy smokes, these guys are great. What were your first impressions of the guys? Like John being there still uh, in the beginning and, and Neil and... Uh, and well, Getty. it was a really cool sounding trio. Um, it was a gig for me. So, of course, I was, you know, I wanted to make it the best I could for the for the band. I was a studio owner. So, you know, I had to pull this off. And then um, when we started, I set them up. We started recording. It was like that oh, it just opened up a whole other thing. It was like Alex's guitar playing. The first thing I said to him was, can we double your guitar? And he went, yeah, yeah, I guess so. And he, and he doubled the guitar so accurately in one take that it sounded like one great big guitar. It was I had one on the left and one on the right. It was astonishing. I was like... Holy smokes, this guy's amazing. And then, of course, Ged went in and did the vocal, and I was like, wow, this guy has got a voice. I've never heard anything like it in my life. And so I was excited. Why didn't you get credit on the first Rush album since you were there for some of that? Um, did I not get credit on it for mixing it? Well, I, 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 I don't. You know, I don't even know, to be honest with you. Yeah, because I didn't know you were there when John Rutsey was still there. I mean, oh I... yeah, yeah. We um, the, the the band came in. The idea was I was going to mix an album. It was on eight track. They recorded it on the graveyard shift at Easton, as I remember. And uh, they didn't know what to do with it. It was like and and Vic Wilson from from uh, management, SRO management, said, "I know this tea bag over at Toronto Sound. He'll help us out." So he brought them over, and we had a blast. We really did. We recorded two tunes from scratch, Finding My Way, and forget the other one. And, um, yeah, it was, it was just a thrill. I remember the time going, holy smokes, these guys are great. What were your first impressions of the guys, like John being there still uh, in the beginning and, and Neil and uh and Well, Getty? it was a really cool-sounding trio. Um, it was a gig for me, so of course I was, you know, I wanted to make it the best I could for the for the band. I was a studio owner, so you know I had to pull this off. And then um, when we started, I set them up. We started recording. It was like that. Oh, it just opened up a whole other thing. It was like Alex's guitar playing. The first thing I said to him was, "Can we double your guitar?" And he went, "Yeah, yeah, I guess so." And he, and he doubled the guitar so accurately in one take that it sounded like one great big guitar. It was, I had one on the left and one on the right. It was astonishing. I was like, holy smokes, this guy's amazing. And then, of course, Ged went in and did the vocal, and I was like, wow, this guy has got a voice. I've never heard anything like it in my life. And so I was excited. Rick Beato, I don't know if you're familiar with him on YouTube. He's, oh, yeah. He's the sure. biggest guy. He is the man. I know, he's wonderful. 
But Rick had said that something interesting. I was just watching it this morning. I don't I don't have a chance to watch what I do, what other people do it, because I don't have it. I'm too busy. Uh, but he had said that Rush, we thought Rush were a lot bigger than they were. They eventually did become that big, but we, the fans, the diehard fans loved them so much. There was something, and, and I guess maybe that happens with every band. That you always think they're the biggest band in the world. Uh, he said, because the, the love, the fervor of the fans, they were like crazy. They just, they're different types of fans. They are. And they've, they've been so loyal too. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, when you go to a show these, well, when they were playing, of course, um, but in the last five years, you know, and there's <laughs> places full of 50 year olds and older. And so it's quite amusing. Neil, when you first heard Neil, what was your impression? John's gone. I was pretty impressed. I mean, it was like he had a much bigger kit. His whole demeanor was so different from John. And uh, and he played great. So, you know, Fly By Night was the first thing we did together. And, uh, yeah, it was it was great. It was like, wow, this is, this is cool. And this, is, this band is going somewhere. I mean, John, I, I enjoyed working with John, but of course he his health didn't allow him to continue. And uh, but he, he he was not the drummer that Neil was, obviously. I mean, he was a rock drummer, plain and simple. Certainly was more than adequate. Lovely guy, but um, it was destiny was not uh, he wasn't meant to be in the band. I asked Andy Curran. I said, "Okay, Andy, why?" I've interviewed him a few times. He says, why is it that it didn't get out that Neil was was sick? And he says, because it's Neil. He says, you know what? People, yeah. risk. I yeah, went, absolutely. how can that not get out? Everyone was completely shocked. And I went, he said, that says something about Neil. They really did. No one yeah, leaked he, anything. He, no, I didn't know. <laughs> I was like, I'd heard rumors he wasn't well, but I didn't, nobody said too much. So I, I said, okay. We Neil and I weren't very close, and uh, certainly after I, my split from the band. So, um, yeah, when I was on holiday in Mexico, it was like I was devastated. It's mm -hmm. like, what? This is not possible. And I spoke to the guys, and of course, they were extremely apologetic and said they were sworn to secrecy and they just couldn't say anything. And I understand that was Neil. To me, after I get off the phone with Jim, you know, I feel like I want to have a nap for all the right reasons. The second conversation we had, I'm going, you know, I'm a spiritual cat. He's way more spiritual than me. I I was that spiritual in the 80s. But the, the this whole journey that he's going through is amazing. It is. Yeah. The stuff he talks about in the book, it's pretty wild. So what do you I think of it? I love it. I mean, I'm sort of leaning in that direction myself. You know, I just um, <clears throat> just lost my mom, who was a hundred, and this is going back a few months now. And um, I got a letter from a psychic friend of mine, and she said, "I was in touch with your mother this morning, and she's doing just great. She's with your dad." And Linda was there too, that's my late wife. And Linda was there, and it was like, wow, really? It's like, I love that sort of stuff. I, can, I, I you know, I'm totally open to it. So, which is good, I think, you know. Well, I, I you know what? I'm 63. I know you got a few years on me, but there's a something, <laughs> there's something, well, there's something in me. I mean, you know, going through divorce, reading all the, the spiritual books in the 80s and, and then leaving it and coming back and being religious in the seventies and leaving that behind. But I'm watching the clock. What, what, you know, let's dwell into this a little bit. I'm watching the clock, even at 63, my, my father-in-law is 80. He's not doing well. And I'm, I'm being more discerning. I'm paying more attention. I'm trying to be more mindful, all these things. But for you, did, did you have a semblance of this when you were younger, when you were a young man? No, no not at all. Not not about death and you know and but I've always been sort of really intrigued with um, um, ghosts 
Um, I've seen ghosts. In what I've capacity? I've experienced ghosts. Well, when I was working on um, The Who, um, Barbara Streisand had just been in the previous week or that week. I can't remember quite what, but <coughs> excuse me. We had four big speakers set up in the control, and that's the way we did it back in those days. You know, speaker one for track one, mm -hmm. two, three, and four, right? It was a four-track studio. And um, on the fourth speaker was a big pile of music. It was about yay big, you know. It was like the whole score for the entire orchestra for the, all the tunes sitting on top of that cabinet. And uh, we fin I finished the tune in the afternoon, mixed it, and uh, I say mixed it. I think we did it mono and then overdubbed the vocals in mono. So if you can call that mixing. And um, I was um, I was waiting for Norman, who was a one of my colleagues, tape op like me. Uh, he came in. He said, so how did the session go? I said, oh, it was great. I said, do you want to listen to it? He goes, oh, yeah. Are you kidding? So we put the tape on. And we're sitting there behind the console, rocking away to <laughs> substitute. We get halfway through the tune, and this huge pile of music, which must have weighed 25 pounds. I mean, it was, like, huge. It lifted up from the speaker. It floated across the room and crashed on the floor. I was like, oh, my God. I <laughs> stopped the tape. It's like... What on earth is going on? And the place was haunted. The studio was haunted. We knew that. I'd had other experiences there, which were equally like, doo -dee -doo 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 -dee -doo -doo. <laughs> so, so I said, well, that was weird, you know. I said, we need to. What we'll do is we'll gather up all the music, we'll put it back on the speaker, and we'll play the song again. Maybe there's some weird thing acoustically in the tune at that point which is, you know, I mean, a stupid idea, really. But we put it back on, and, of course, nothing happened. <laughs> but that was, that was a real, it was a weird moment. So with that, you bank that. And then, obviously, when another thing happens, it fortifies your belief that we're not here. I mean, there's uh, realms of existence, for sure. Exactly. There's another, you know, you know meet thing going on, you know, a, what do you call it, like a... Uh, a different time zone that's existing alongside us. Yeah, that that sometimes sort of slips into ours. It's um, it's fascinating, fascinating. How far back do you go with Jim? Not that long, as a matter of fact. Um, probably. Well, um, um, I forget the name of his album now. But the the one he did. The, uh, oh. Jeez. What's it was, the time? It was time. I can't remember the title of it. It was oh, about okay. five five years ago. Yeah, it came out. Okay. <clears throat> so I met him a couple of years before that. So it's probably around seven or eight years now. Yeah. Yeah. He's like no other interview. <laughs> He's an interesting fellow, isn't he? I, I, I well, first of all, we were going to talk about music again, and I'd already talked to him about the three those three famous guitars he's worked with, and uh, and the songs. And uh, and that was interesting. And sometimes when I interview someone again, I'll ask them the same question and I'll get a slightly different answer. But it's the same thing. It's just more meat. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. But this time we talked about spirituality, I think, for half an hour about, you know, him and his wife contacting his wife. I worked with I used to be the guy, the radio guy that would work with psychics. I don't know why they picked me, but they always did. And I'd be in the audience with the microphone and they'd be on stage and I'd be like, oh, well, you have a question. And uh, a few psychics still owe me money, but they're, I guess they're not <laughs> supposed to. I'm serious. Like 3,000, there's a psychic in Calgary that owes me $3,000. I never, I'll never ask for it. It's fine. But I've come upon all my whole life. It's just been one thing after another. And then you leave it and uh, you come back to it and you go, you can't escape it. I mean, where are you now? Like, like I asked, I asked Richie Furey when Rusty Young died. I said, okay, Richie, you're a minister. Interviewed him many times, so I felt comfortable with him. I said, you're a minister. I think I know what answer you're going to give me. Where's Rusty? He, he died a week before. Thought he was going to cancel the interview. He said, no, no, let's do it. 
And he, you know, he gave me the religious version. I'm not religious at all. And, 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 but it still has common denominators, which is there's another dimension, which yeah. everyone agrees on. And there's ways of communicate with them. And no matter what happens, I'll be okay if I die. So where yeah. do we go when we die? Oh, who knows? Um, I, that's a tough one. <clears throat> My spouse is very spiritual and, um, she how does it come out in her how does it come out in her how, uh, like uh, the... well she, she she believes that she's on this earth to learn for the next time she comes back and she's been here before so that's very interesting but just before i forget i always remember when we met with lizzie for the first time elizabeth she was chatting with with anne and Anne, who's quite spiritual, she said to me, I don't know about Lizzie. She said she was talking about stuff that I just couldn't get a grasp on. She's like knows so much more than I do. That she is. was wonderful, just beautiful, lovely soul, very gentle and very, very quiet and very bright. And uh, yeah, she was uh, she had things going on that Anne could not fathom. <laughs> It's fascinating. It's interesting yeah. when Jim talked about it in the first interview, slightly talked about it. You know, you get YouTube's an interesting creature, right? Because, you know, I get all kinds of stupid comments that make no sense. And then I get mostly good comments because I like to do my homework. But at the same time, when he talks about his spirituality, which I thought, I wonder how this is going to go down. I asked him. He says, no, no, of course, that's me. I'm not hiding that. And we, he got amazingly, because he's firmly footed in his belief and that says something to people when they oh, listen yeah. to it right absolutely you know you're going well this guy is this guy means it this is not words these are not like something to hang on to um so do, has that changed your daily practice at all do you meditate do you pay attention to your dreams how does it come through with you <laughs> i don't have that on a day-to-day -day basis i'm um i do dream a lot I don't meditate, um, but um, I I just seem to, I feel like I'm in contact all the time. There's always something going on out there that I would like, you know, I don't want to miss in terms of the uh, the, the other side. So you're, you're being mindful, you're paying attention. Oh, Looking absolutely. For yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, it doesn't surprise me that he is the way he is. I mean... Here's a guy who played in a band that had Eric Clapton, <laughs> um, Jimmy Page, and um, Jeff Beck. Jeff Beck as guitar players in the band. I mean, that's got to mean something to your psyche. You got it's it's got to open up doors. It's, it has to. Well, you're in the same for, position for me, anyway. Well, you're in the yeah. same position though. No, I guess so. Yeah. No, I was thinking about you know you as a man this morning. I'm going. I'm thinking about like this guy's in this room, and I say the same damn thing in a lot of interviews because I interview people of that that level, right? A level I can't understand. Well, you got to do the work to get in the room. I mean, it's a cliche, but you have to do. You're not getting in that room unless you do the work. And you were surrounded. You deserve to be there. There was. I hope you never had imposter syndrome because you you because uh, you did the work. Imposter syndrome that never occurred to me, but <laughs> really, so you never did have that, like little old me. What am I doing here? How can? How, why am I in this room with these guys? No, 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 no. I knew I was why I was there. I was contributing and um, and adding something to the mix. It was um, chemistry. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no denying that. When you get people in a room, it's uh, it's 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 quite amazing what goes on. Do you look back at your life? There must be some sense of little old me when you look back and you go, you know, if you because it's like rediscovering your fridge, they say. Sometimes you go, hey, that's a really nice fridge. Or you go, oh, my God, it's been a great life or whatever that semblance of that might be. Oh, but yeah, it has been a great life. I, I, I always used to say that I'd never worked a day in my life. It was so much fun. Yeah. So After I interviewed the guys in Klaatu, I, I might have reached out to you. I'm not sure if I ever did, but... Uh, uh, the three of them who are very eclectic characters 
So, yeah, calling occupants. I mean, that, that's another example. Like, I was totally into that whole idea of contact, World Contact Day and reaching out. It was That was important to me at that point. It still is, really. I think I think we could use it more than any time now. Well, I, don't you find though? There's, there's like you, you, yeah, you've kind of always been there though. You might not be a conscious thing, but I mean, look at the spacey kind of even rush. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it appeals to me. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, well with with Klaatu, did you? Uh, what were your impressions of those guys? Like Terry. I, I talked to John Willos, Chuck, and and I, when I talked to Sarish from uh, from uh, what's the name uh, uh, the Harmonium, I asked them both the same question separately. I said, Sarish, John, did you did you put so much on the table that somehow because John Willos, Chuck, has basically left he's left the music industry for the most part. He, uh, he left a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, but 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 I asked him. And Sarish left Harmonium and did solo stuff, but for a while he was just so two separate interviews. But the same topic, I'm going. Did you leave so much on the table that there was nothing left for a while? That you said, "That's it, my cards are on the table." And they both said, "Oh yeah, yeah." That was just. I found John to be uh, uh, um, different than Terry and and D. I, I found no, oh, yeah, they were extremely different personalities, all three of them. What was it like going into that first that first album? It was great. I mean, they they I, they bought me a demo. What John did actually, John was looking for a gig as a tape op at my studio, and um, he uh, he bought this tape in, and I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" And uh, I said, "I don't know if I want to hire you as a tape op, but I sure would like to record this music." That's how we got involved. Really? Yeah. That's how it all started? Yeah. That's how it started. Did the tape sound like the Beatles? No, not at all. I mean, I wasn't... I I didn't... I mean, it wasn't until later on when we got more of the tunes and we started doing some Beatles tricks and, you know, and you could hear the influence. But originally, no, it didn't sound like the Beatles. That wasn't why I wanted to sign them at all. It was just amazing. Did, did like you ever so... meet George Martin, by the way? No. It would I have didn't. been interesting you talking to George Martin. Sorry. George Martin. Yeah, maybe. I I know. I, I've never been to Abbey Road either. Can you believe that? Isn't that terrible? Wow. <laughs> They've mastered a few of my records. But... Yeah. But I've never been there. I've spent lots of time there. My brother lives there. You know, my brother's yeah. a very successful uh, yeah. engineer, as you probably know. I mean, obviously, it sounded like the Beatles. Uh, I never knew. I never thought it was the Beatles because I just you could tell. I mean, I, I'm very good with voices. And I could say, well, that's not John Lennon. But it sounds like someone sounding like John Lennon. I mean. OK, I never I never got that, but um, <laughs> really? you, know, you all everybody hears things differently. Yeah, it was instrumentation. We were using a Hofner bass, too. So there were there were things that were sort of leaning towards that. And John's bass style was very much sort of. McCartney-esque. He certainly wasn't Getty Lee. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Again, thank Bill Simzik, best musicians in the world. Uh, Hope was a, a concept album, of course, Space Travelers. And I always look at Space Travelers and the other side as being kind of similar somehow. I, I don't know. I don't, Do you believe in the uh, little guys out there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just a matter of time, I think, before we uh, make contact. But do you think do you think maybe they're not in I fact guess, we may have made contact already we just don't know it. Well, that's that's the running line, right? I know. I and know. the other side of it is maybe they're not interested. I'm going. What if they're so far advanced that that they just go? Well, we're just going to leave that alone. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? We could be some horrible experiment. Do, do you watch the? Uh, yeah. Oh my God, eh? That's a bigger picture. Yeah. yeah can you yeah, imagine? Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're we're, we're their entertainment. Yeah, they're watching this interview right now. Oh no! <laughs> I, 
By the way, that picture of uh, you recording moving pictures, you're at the end. You've probably seen it. Getty's like this on the on the board. You're at the end. And Alex is sitting on something in the back. You look like the coolest dude ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like, I'm going, yeah, yeah. In my younger days. Well, we all had those, right? Another thing about Fly By Night, there was uh, Fly By Night, even the cover. I mean, there was bright uh, everything about it, I remember thinking everyone I knew loved that album. Uh, memories of recording that 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 record. Obviously, the title song was a hit. Yeah, yeah. I I, I mean I I remember it <clears throat> not vividly, but I mean I can I I remember doing it. Of course, it was a lot of fun. It was yeah. done very quickly. I remember that. I think Wasn't I it two, two weeks? You said two two weeks for. Uh, Pre-production, record, and mix. But I managed to pull it off. Was that a budget <laughs> thing, or is that just when in Rome, that's what yeah. they do? No, no, it was it was partly a budget thing and partly that the band had such a busy uh, playing schedule that they were only around for a certain amount of time. We had to make the most of it. But they were, you know, they were well-schooled. They were well-rehearsed, and and they could make changes really easily. It wasn't... There, was, there wasn't a lot of pushback. It was like, you know, we need to change this or we need to do that. And they'd be, yeah, let's do it. And they'd play it. It's interesting so, with Caressive Steel, which wasn't as successful. And then the, the record company's telling them, well, we got to like, you know, you got to make it a little bit more commercial. And of all things, they go into 2112. Uh, what kind of conversations were you guys having? Because the record label did not want 2112, even though 2112 opened up a whole new world for them. Exactly. Well, it was uh, in my position as producer, I mean, as co-producer, <clears throat> I wanted to make the best record we could. They came in, they played this material for me, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. Let's do it. And we just got stuck into it and recorded it and made it the best we could. So it wasn't, I, I wasn't even thinking about sing singles that didn't didn't appeal to me at all i wanted to make a great record and and i felt we were and apparently we did by the way speaking of that what's the greatest record you produced i know that's hard can you name three oh, maybe that's... or jeez it's like picking children isn't it yeah yeah exactly i mean moving pictures was a was a real treat but then so is permanent waves. Well, Alex has said moving pictures was very happy. It it was very happy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They all were. We had we had really good vibe in the studio. It's moving pictures. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a thrill to make. It really was volleyball. And it was nice. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was wild. <laughs> Going back to Klaatu for a second, Terry was saying that you uh, the the owl sound in front of call, calling occupants was you with the stubby. He says you were making a sort of a. Oh, is that what it was? He said you had a an old beer and you went. You, yeah, you yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That makes sense. God, that's see a lot of these details you just don't remember. Tom Sawyer. Yes. I've got to ask you about that song because everyone would kill me if I didn't. Uh, that is their, like that ended up being their signature song. It's their biggest song on Spotify by a long shot. Um, uh, as Alex would say, he says we opened it, we opened with it, we closed with it. Uh, any memories about that tune? Um, well, it, it was a lot of fun making it. <laughs> um, we 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 drove into Marin Heights. On a Friday, I think we did set up the drums that evening because we were really anxious to get cracking on things. We set up the drums, and they were sounding pretty damn good. And Saturday we cut the track, and it was just it just was it everything flowed the way it was supposed to. You always had a great drum sound. Like I mean, you I used to love the way Gus Dudgeon would produce Elton John, Nigel Olson for Elton John. Mm, absolutely. Uh, uh, so did you have a certain method of, of miking the drums that was all not your really? No, I mean, not really different from 
most the way most people mic drums. But um, I just I played drums in a band like when I was a kid. So they was always very dear to my heart. And I love programming. Or I, I haven't done a lot of programming in the last couple of years, but um, I love programming drums and um, and working with really good drummers. And I've had the advantage of working with great drummers, really. Yeah. I'm working with Paul DeLong right now. Oh, that's, God. That is a thrill, let me tell you. Talk about a Canadian legend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just put an album together with David Barrett and Scott Matthews. It's a three-piece instrumental album and Paul's the drummer. And that's the new David Barrett trio. And it's deadly. It really is. It's just great. I've got to track Paul down. He, there's a guy I've always wanted to. As a Canadian, I'm a real Canadian. I love, I, I'm a lover of CanCon. I always have been. Why they? Why the band call you, is it Brune? Is that how you pronounce it? Brune, yes. Um, I remember uh, Neil saying Big Bill Brunzi, who was a, obviously a very famous blues guitarist. And uh, that's how it started. And then it ended up being Brune. And it was it stuck. And it, it, and it became funny. a song. It did. Brune's Bane, yeah. <laughs> By the way, All the World's a Stage, I played that live album Maybe Hot August Night by Neil Diamond a little bit more, but that's one of the, that's one of my all time favorite live albums. Uh, putting down a live album, how different is that as opposed to, are you there at the recording? How does that work? Or are you also there in the studio when you're mixing it? Or Yeah, I was there both in that particular case. <clears throat> and I think um, the live recording on, moving pictures supersedes that i don't know if you've heard that that's the it's an hour and a half show but at maple leaf gardens it complete from beginning to end and it's and i mixed that what three years ago two years ago mm -hmm. and i'm really pleased with that that's one of my my best live recordings i recorded that too I, I met Dave Marston at an award show in Toronto years ago. Uh, I was very familiar with CFNY. And of course, you know where I'm going, Spirit of the Radio, Spirit yeah. of Radio. Uh, I like the story where they couldn't mention the radio station because they were still trying to get a, a radio play. And, and David said, well, we, you, it's okay if you don't mention. They said, we can't mention the radio station. But there's another song on Spotify that's like freaking. I remember the when I heard that song, I remember turning around going. I know. What a great tune. Any recollections of recording that one? <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. I remember, you know, just getting everything all set up and then Alex's guitar riff. I mean, that was, that's pretty stunning. It's great yeah. stuff. Closer to the Heart, Farewell of the Kings, uh, a magazine I remember. And, and throughout time, people would compare Getty to, to Robert Plant, which I never really got because I... I, I didn't could... either. No. I don't think they sounded not. alike. No. Soaring vocals. Especially now. I mean, yeah. you know, Robert's changed his whole thing, and he's, he's he, I admire him. He's done really well. It's amazing how he sounds different eh, when he sings with Alison Krause. You can't great? even tell it's him. I know, I know. Obviously, you're producing still, and you still do things. I'm a firm believer. Yeah. I'll never quit because I'm going, if I quit, I'll die. I, I, I love doing Yeah, that. I feel the same way. Got three things on the go. I've got um, the new Chris Heron album. Chris Heron is the leader of Tiles, um, a, a Detroit band. I'm sure you've heard them. And um, he um, he he lost his father to Alzheimer's probably seven or eight years ago. And we started recording some material that wasn't really suitable for a Tiles record. And uh, he he's a huge Elton John fan and, and loves writing pop and you know, in-depth pop, not just fluffy pop. And um, he, we started this 12 years ago and uh, he uh, we just finished it. <laughs> we just okayed everything and got all the parts for the manufacturing just a week or two ago. So... Uh, it's a lovely record too. Some great people playing on it. Just amazing. It's not out yet. Well, out 
in the spring. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'll- Rick Beato, by the way, called uh, uh, Xanadu the best Rush song. Reaction to that? I, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, I, I think I'm pretty sure I've seen that when he goes through it, sort of step by step. And it's a, it's an epic piece. It's got, it's a wonderful piece. Great melodies and a really great soundscape. That was a, a lot of fun to record. There must have been times when you would like sit down and watch. I mean, no, I know they came prepared, and it's something you've said many times, and 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 uh, people who write about them say the same thing. But you know, I I can't imagine sitting down and watching Alex just go through his uh, something for the first time and going, "Where in the heck did that come from?" You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're right. This young man <clears throat> is plugged into again something that I can't comprehend, you know? Yeah. Great player. Very creative. And he's always got lots of new ideas and managed to extract some really cool moments from him. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Are you not surprised by the state of the studio because people, I mean, obviously that something happened there, but, and and then there was that campaign to bring it back. And I'm going, that sounds like a campaign to sell t-shirts, but, uh, Oh, that was total nonsense, yeah. in my opinion. You know, it was burnt down by a female folk band. The house. Really? Not the studio, but the, the, the residence. Yeah. I mean, the stones were there and lots of debauchery went on there, but it got burnt down by a female band. I thought that was pretty funny. <clears throat> I forget who told me. <laughs> Uh, and that was Colin James. It was someone who told me, he says, I look at La Studio as a Buddhist lesson. I'm going, what, impermanence? And he said, well, yeah, it, it, that was a time. It was great. There was a lot of things that happened there. It's a sad thing. Don't get me wrong. I wish it was still there. But recording is so different now that oh, it's hard totally. for studio. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't work anymore. Running a studio like that. Wow. The, 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 very few and far between. And so expensive. It's ridiculous. I mean, to put the right gear in a place like that, it would cost you like, you know, 20, 30 million dollars. Yeah. Limelight, moving pictures. Alex had said it's one of his favorite songs. Limelight? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What a great tune. I mean, it would, and that's so Neil, too. That whole story is like, wow. You guys had five, six, he says five, six takes of that, and you took the best parts of everything and put it together? I don't remember that specifically. But um, what I would do is we'd cut the band off the floor, but we'd be, I would be listening to the drums. Everything else was just being roughed in. So it would be the drums. We get the drum take and then we do the bass. And we get the bass right, listening to the guitar, but doing the bass right. And then we'd start concentrating on the guitars. So it was done. It, we might have done a few edits in the in the drum take rather than taking one complete take. I don't remember it being six takes, though. But uh, even if it was, so what? I'm a firm believer in you played it. I want that to be part of the record. You know, I don't want any of this. No, 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 I got to do it in one take. I find that really boring. Alex and uh, Getty are, they've insinuated many times that, and I know since the break after your last album with them, you know, you've come full circle and now, now you guys are friends again. But but do you think, I mean, the 50th of the first album, isn't it next year, I think? If- I believe it is, yeah. Something's got to happen. Something will happen. I don't know what it's going to be, but there's um, rumors afoot. <laughs> what have you heard? Uh, well, there are rumors. Um, don't really know. I don't know if it's going to be a box set or if it's going to be a, a re-release of the first album. Not really not sure. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I, I, w- I won't find out for another couple of months when you left you said you weren't happy when you you had left i mean obviously you guys were going in different musical directions this is your last one so you can go on with your life after this um uh, signals yeah yeah that after, was the last one yeah but after that's already that, out yeah 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 how how did that go after how were you told 
I, um, I think it was Ged that called me up and basically said, you know, we're, we've had a great time working together, but we feel we want to move on. It's kind of like a, a relationship. We need, we need a change, but you know, we might get back together again at some point as, as it turns out, we didn't, but, um, yeah, he was, he was really good about it. And I was under, I understood where, where he was coming from. I mean, 11 albums with the same band. <laughs> That's pretty outrageous. Did you have to turn down anybody when you were working? Cause you guys were working every year. Did yeah, you have I to did, turn, yeah. Who'd you turn yeah. down? You must've turned down some people. Yeah. I, I, the, the, the one that I, I remember the most was Asia. Wow. That would have been a nice record to make, but um, hey, was it the first album? Do you breaks. remember? I, th- I think it might have been. I, I, I honestly don't remember. It's so long ago. It was a brief conversation, but, but uh, yeah, that was unfortunate. Were you good at that? Of going? No, I know how much time I need. I know how much time recovery I need after an album. That I will not. I, I know my. You kind of know yourself after a while. How much you can take on, right? That's true, but I I was a, a family man too. Yeah, I had two daughters at that point, and um, I wanted to spend time with them. So I would do the work that I wanted to do and enjoy it immensely, and spend time with my family. I didn't work. I I wasn't a workaholic. After Rush, did you take extra time? Did you? Well, I still did a lot of records, but um, I I. I didn't take extra time. I mean, it, I, I spent quite a good bit of time with my family during the Rush tenure. I mean, we only made one album a year. Yeah. I mean, Moving Pictures, what, took three months. That's in nine months left to make some other records and spend time with the family. So mm-hmm. nothing really changed in that respect. I'm still the same now. Oh, and I was just talking to John Helliwell of Super Tramp. And, oh, and- my God, I just recorded. I just mixed him. No way! Yeah, yeah, he's playing on a track. It's um, "Love Is Like Oxygen," which was the sweet, I yeah. think, back yeah, when. Sweet, yeah. Um, Barry Sparks, bass player, amazing bass player. He put this together. It's like thirteen minutes long. It's got the most amazing players on it. And John Halliwell's playing saxophone on the end. Oh, my God. I love John. And it's great. What a small world. What a nice human being. He was so nice. You know, April Wine's my favorite Canadian band. (laughs) Is that right? Favorite Canadian band. I Uh, love it. You engineered Electric Jewels. So at that point, Jim Clinch and Miles were still doing kind of a Lennon and even singing together in some songs. And of course, then Jim only had two songs on Stand Back after that. I know you didn't work on that one. But but what was it like working? Cause weren't the Henman brothers still kind of in there before they were replaced? Jeez, you know, it's going back so long. And it was only one evening. How did it go? Um, well, tell me what you remember. It went you really well. And and uh, again, my memory is failing me. Uh, Ralph Murphy, yeah, Murphy's Law. He had a he had a, a, a thing called Murphy's Law. He would teach how to write songs. But he was the producer. Yeah. It was a good night. It was quick and dirty, and it came out great. That This has been uh, a dream come true. You have no idea... Like I followed your career uh, and it means a lot to me that you gave me an hour of uh, of your time and it's been fun. Well, you're more than welcome. Yeah. yeah. Good. Hey, good. Here you go. Excellent. Take care of yourself. Great meeting you. Nice meeting Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that. Our entire interview with Terry Brown. Remember, if you want to donate to the channel, help us keep healthy. There are links in the description. You can make a PayPal donation or join our Patreon, get early access to all our videos. Remember, comment on our videos. We read all the comments. Subscribe to our channel. Share our videos on social media. And like the videos as well. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book. 